Good morning. How are you doing today? All right. So uh, why don't we start with some prayer? I think we all need it, right? Amen? All right. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity we have today, Lord, to be in your presence. What a blessing and honor that is, Lord, that you've invited us here. And God, that we have the opportunity to spend this next 30 or 40 minutes together uh, with you and with one another. And I pray, God, that as we talk about such an important subject matter today, I pray, God, that you would give me the power to deliver it in a way, God, that would be honoring to you. God, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit as I empty myself. And God, I pray that you would give your people a a heart to hear, uh, a will to obey, God. And I pray, Father, that in every way that, uh, Lord, that you you will be honored and lifted up by what we say here today. In Jesus' holy and powerful and awesome name we pray. Amen. So today... We're going to talk about controlling our thoughts. Anybody here have a problem controlling their thoughts? You know, maybe uh, either in temptation or maybe anxiety or, or, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about the controlling of our minds. And so that's where we're going to begin today. That's where we're going to continue in our series on habits. And before I get there, I want to remind you of a couple things. First of all, I want to remind you that we're not saved because we control our minds. We are saved because we have come to a place in our life where we recognize how broken we are and how much we need the Savior. And we thrust our life upon His mercy and He's the one that saves us. And now that we are saved, now God is in the process of conforming us into His image, conforming us to be like Jesus. And so part of that is His work and part of that is our work. And so as we think about that, Today, we're going to talk about how we then, to be like Jesus, how we control our minds. And I'm telling you, this is a very crucial element in our walk with God. And it is, it is hard because the truth is, is most people have uphill hopes and downward habits. So we just let our minds go. We just let our minds wander wherever they go. And as a result, we get ourselves in a lot of trouble. So today, what I want to do is I, was, I want to start with, I want to front load this sermon with a lot of scripture and uh, not a lot, but some, and uh, just enough for us to meditate on what God is going to do. So the first passage of scripture I want to show you is found in the book of Romans. And uh, this is Paul's writing. Paul was this amazing man of faith. He was a guy that used to hate the church, and now he loves the church. And and, uh, he had this miraculous conversion on the road to Damascus. And and, uh, and now God uses this guy who was once a Christ hater. He uses him to write the majority of the New Testament. And so with that in mind, Romans chapter, um, uh, uh, well, wherever it is, somewhere in Paul's writings, the book of Romans. <laughs> it, just, it just escaped me. You think this is easy, don't you? All right, okay. <laughs> so actually, this is Romans chapter 12. <laughs> this, I just remembered where it was. Okay, it's, it's what happens when you get old. Romans chapter 12, Paul says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Very clear command. Don't do that. But let God transform you into a new person. Now notice the method that God uses by changing the way you think. You see that? Then you'll learn how to know God's will for for you, which is good and, and pleasing and perfect. God uses our minds in a very powerful way. Everything begins with a thought. Everything that I do Everywhere I go, everything about me begins with a thought. What we think determines how we feel. How we feel determines how we behave. And how we behave determines our destiny. So it all begins with a thought. So now you understand how crucial it is that when a thought comes into your mind, you've got to ask the question, where'd that come from? Is that from you, God? Or is that from me? Or is that from the devil? Where's that thought come from? And so I've got to learn to discern my thoughts in a very clear way. Our thoughts then determine our destiny. Romans chapter 8 verse 5 says this, St. Paul writing this, he says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Wow. How do I know if I'm being dominated by the sinful flesh or the sinful nature that I have in my life? It's because I'm always thinking about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit Think about things that please the Spirit. And so when you begin to realize that, you see again how your thought life controls where you go every day. A couple of weeks ago, 
Pastor Miguel delivered an amazing message here at Grace, and he talked about Dr. Carolyn Leaf, and she has written a book called Switch On Your Brain. And he talked to us about how, in this book, she has discovered through her research that how we think controls pathways. These pathways then allow us to either go back, go to the right or to the left. And it's such an amazing discovery. And what, what she says is that when you and I learn how to replace bad thinking with right thinking, it literally changes our direction, changes how we have the capability of actually thinking. It actually changes our thought processes, how the mind actually does the process. It changes that. It creates new pathways for you and I. The Bible's been saying this for centuries, but it's good to know that some, some contemporary uh, authors are saying it as well. And so where we want to start this conversation today, and that's what this is, is this is a conversation about you, and this is a conversation about how you control your thought life. And so the, what we want to ask today is then, okay, where do I begin? Where do I start in the process of controlling my thought life? So we start with a question, and that question is simply this. What are the lies that I am currently believing? What are the lies that I am currently believing? We always are asking that question because here's the reality. I don't care whether you're 16 or whether you're 86. You probably, mo no, I'm going to take that back. There are lies that you are believing right now, right here, right today. I am certain of that because if there weren't, you would have this perfect walk with Jesus. And you don't, do you? You have kind of a broken walk with Jesus. And part of it is because you are believing some lies. And here's the, here's the reality of those lies is that I don't think you're believing intentionally. I just, don't, I just don't think you understand that some of the things that you believe are actually lies. That the evil one is sown inside of you, maybe even from childhood. And so the reality is, I want to just make sure we all are on the same page. The reality is not the person sitting in back of you or front of you or beside you. You right now probably more than likely have some major lies that you are believing. And those major lies create a thought process that create anxiety, that create sinful patterns, that create all sorts of havoc inside of your life. And it's not God's intended will for you to live with that kind of tyranny in your life. God has a new way of living. God has a new way of, of you living. And the truth is, is that it begins when you understand how these thought processes affect you. And so you always are asking God. Step number one is I'm always asking God to reveal the lies that I am believing. And you, never, you can never outgrow that. There are lies as I'm standing on this stage here this morning... I'm, gonna, I'm certain that there are lies that I am believing about myself, about others, about God. There are certain things that have been sown into my life and I have to, I'm in the process of learning how to identify those things and the only one who can tell me what they are honestly is God himself as he reveals himself to me primarily through his word but, but sometimes through other people as well. And so this is so important for us to understand. So we, we normally start with a question what are the lies that I am currently believing? And that is such an important evaluation. And how do I know what lies I'm believing? I begin to listen to the conversations that I have in my mind. You all have conversations in your mind, right? Come on now. It's not crazy. You're not crazy. You have conversations with yourself. You talk to yourself. And sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's not so subtle. Every once in a while, my wife will walk in and, you know, I'm taking a shower and and uh, she'll go, who are you talking to? And I, and I lie and I say, I'm talking to God. And, you know, really, I'm just talking, just, talking to, I'm just talking to myself sometimes. Anybody else like that here at all in this auditorium? Yes, okay. I'm not alone. Those of you that are introverts probably don't do that. But extroverts talk their way through their problems. Introverts think their way through their problems. So I just talk out loud. And what's interesting is when I begin to listen to myself, sometimes I say, that was stupid. So I have to learn the discipline of listening to the conversations that are going on inside of my mind. And I tell you, it is such a powerful thing. To, it's a tool that God has given to us that we should be using on a regular basis. Um, we're, we're masters at lying to ourselves, by the way. Just so you know, we've been good at it. We've probably done it all of our lives. So we're really good about doing it. read about a story about a little boy who knocks at his neighbor's door and tells the owner that um, something has landed inside of her garage and that something that he owns is there now, 
and uh, could he get in the garage and find it's this thing that belongs to him. So she goes, the homeowner goes to the garage, opens the door, and she notices, she notices that there is a baseball sitting on the, you know, the driveway on the garage floor there, and there's also a window that is broken just about the size of a baseball. And so she asks this little boy, how do you suppose that your baseball got into my garage? And so he looks at you know, the window, and he looks at the baseball, he looks at the, the homeowner, and he says, uh, I don't know, I guess I threw the ball just through that hole that's in the glass already. <laughs> so we're masters at it, right? We're masters at telling ourselves a story. In fact, here's the reality. This is the truth. This is why we're so good at it, is that we'd go crazy if we didn't feel some form of self-justification. So we're constantly in the business of self-justifying. And that's what's so dangerous because the only one who can actually justify us is God himself. But we practice it all the time and we practice it by lying, lying to others, lying to ourselves, lying to God. And what God wants to do is that he wants to break that. So where I start is in my thought life. I start breaking this pattern by asking the question, what are the lies that I am believing? And the truth is, is if you don't think those things hurt you, you're, you're mistaken. Your lies hurt you greatly. They're very destructive in your life, even though they seem, maybe seem innocent. The lies that you're believing are actually very destructive in your life. There's a pastor by the name of Marvin Winans. And he talks about, in one of his sermons, he talks about when he was growing up that he had, he had um, some younger brothers and he had a baby brother by the name of Bibi. And so the other older brothers would oftentimes go to Bibi and they just wanted to see Bibi cry because that's what older brothers do. So they, would, they went to Bibi and they said, you know, we want to tell you the truth. I mean, nobody's going to tell you, but we're the only ones who will tell you. Mom and dad found you under a rock. And, and Bibi, the youngest, would go crying to his dad, bawling his eyes out, and uh, his dad would say, that's not true, it's not true, your brothers are lying to you, I'm going to punish them later, I'm going to discipline them later, but listen to me, I'm your father, I was there when you were born, I was there all, I've been there all the days of your life, I'm your father and I love you unconditionally, I'm your dad. And then he went and punished the older brothers. So about, this would be good for about six months and the older brothers would go, it's time to make Bibi cry again. So they would go back to him and they would tell him some form of the story again, you know, maybe making up different variants of it, saying, uh, you know, you're not really part of our family. Look, you don't even look like us. You were adopted. You're not one of, you're not one of dad's kids. And so B.B. would do all the same thing. He would run. He would cry to his dad. and His, his dad would say, listen, B.B., I'm telling you the truth. I'm your dad. I was there the day you were born. I'm your father. I love you. And there's no, the end of story. Well, a third time comes around and the brothers got together and decided that um, they were going to make B.B. cry again. So they went and told him some story about the fact that he didn't belong in the family, that, uh, you know, that they found him somewhere in the wilderness. And, and so B.B. starts crying. He runs to his dad. And uh, <clears throat> so the first thing that his dad says to B.B. is says, listen, if you keep coming to me like this, if you keep coming to me like this and telling me, that you're believing your brothers instead of me, I'm going to have to discipline you because what you are believing is hurting you. And now listen to me carefully. The lies that you are believing hurt you. They dishonor your father in heaven, certainly, but they are destructive in your own life. God has told you over and over and over and over and over again through his word, I am your father. I love you. I was there the day you were born. I knew you in your mother's womb. I was before creation. I knew you. I know the number of hairs that you have on your head. I know everything about you. You are my son. You are my daughter. I love you. And I'll never stop loving you. And when you begin and you continue to doubt that over and over and over and over again, I'm telling you, listen, it's destructive. In your own life you're creating destructive pathways it creates anxiety it creates sinful behavior it creates separation between you and God so this is so important that you and I learn to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and realize that not everything that comes through my mind is truth 
and that I've got to learn to discern what is true and what is false. And that is such an important discipline in our life. And I am certain that many of us don't do well at it. Does that make sense to you? So am I preaching to the right crowd or am I preaching to the wrong crowd? So you've got, you've got to call out the lies in your own life. You've got to call them out. And that's why the Word of God is so important. That's why last weekend we talked about habits. We talked about putting a relationship to God first and putting the Word of God into your life on a daily basis. As first things are first because I've got to have a tool in my life that constantly exposes me to the truth so that I can then live the, the life that God would have me to live. I can call out the lies in my own life. And that's why we read the Bible every day. And it's why I hang out in Proverbs a lot. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And so I hang out there a lot in my daily devotion before God. And Proverbs 28, 26 is a verse that really resonates with me. I hope it resonates with you. It says, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. <laughs> wow. Whoever trusts in his own mind. You know that conversation that goes on inside your head? If you trust in that, the Bible calls you a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. So I need to verbalize the truth out loud. This is really complicated. You'd think when I say this to an introvert that I was asking them for their firstborn to verbalize this stuff out loud, but it's important for you to every day verbalize truth with your lips outside. So tell me why. Okay, I will. James, the brother of Jesus, said this, that the tongue is like the rudder of a ship. It sets the whole course of your direction. What I'm saying out loud is really showing the direction of my life. It's really pointing me in that direction. If I want to point in a different direction, I start verbalizing truth instead of lies. That's why it's so important. Very important. Y'all get this? Y'all good with that? And I'm going to just simply say there is a lie behind every temptation that you'll ever face. Every temptation you ever face in life, I don't care what it is, there is a temptation, there is a lie behind that temptation. For example, one of the things that I've heard over and over and over and over again in, in you know, my many years of ministry is I've heard people come to my office, they sit down and they say, my, my spouse isn't making me happy anymore. My spouse isn't making me happy anymore as if I'm going to make their spouse make them happy. <laughs> Going, what do, you, what do you want me to do? I don't know. What, what do you think I should do here? But here's the, here's the lie. That is, here's the lie that's there. Your spouse wasn't created by God to make you happy. That is not the truth. Happiness comes inside. Happiness comes from a walk with God. Happiness comes because you choose it, not because somebody else is making you happy. Now listen to me here carefully, because divorces happen every day in this country because someone starts thinking, my wife, my husband is no longer making me happy. And I'm simply saying, you're believing a lie. And your next wife or your next husband isn't going to make you happy either. I'm just telling you. Or the third one or the fourth one or the fifth one isn't going to make you happy either because happiness comes from inside. You with me on this? You're just staring at me. Okay. So this is so good. This is so powerful. The next principle. So we're talking about I've got to recognize the lies in my life. That's first step. Step number two is that I need to depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit. I need to depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit because willpower won't work. Willpower doesn't work. I, I can't will myself when it comes to a temptation. I can't say, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do this, and then it doesn't happen. Fact is, the opposite happens. The things that I do, I don't want to do. And the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. I'm just saying, I'm in this vicious cycle sometimes. I'm just telling you the truth. Willpower does not work in my life. I don't have the strength to do, I don't have the strength to have willpower in my life. So I want to drive this home because it's so important. What I need instead of willpower is the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. So how do I get the power of the Holy Spirit? Let me show it to you. A master martial artist asked Bruce Lee one day to teach him everything he knew about martial arts. And Bruce said, okay, I'll do that. He held up two cups, both filled with water. And he said, the first cup represents all of your knowledge about martial arts. Everything you know is in this one cup. The second cup represents everything that I know about martial arts. So for you to learn anything from me, you've got to pour out 
everything you know about martial arts so that I can pour in everything that I know about martial arts into your life. So let's make that, let's take that to a spiritual level. So this glass represents everything you know about God and about victory and about power and about walking in the Spirit and about the Holy Spirit in your life, about God Himself. This represents everything that you know about that. This represents everything that God knows in His little finger. Okay? Do we understand that? So for what, so what has to happen, don't miss this, what has to happen for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit is that you have to pour everything that you know out. Because God can't pour into your life all that He is until all of you is gone. That's how it works. And the problem is, and the problem is, is that we know that intellectually, you applaud that, and yet this is what we do. We ask God to add to whatever we're doing, right? Instead of emptying ourselves of all that we know, of all that we are, and, and that's a daily thing. That's not a one-time thing. I have to daily empty everything that I know and everything that I understand about God. I have to empty that out and let God pour into my life everything that He wants for me. It's a daily thing. And until we get to that point in our life, we're still going to be stuck with willpower. Good luck with that. How's it working for you? Not so good? Not so good in my life either. Because the only kind of power that works is God's power, not willpower, not my power. It's His power. And His power isn't going to be operative in my life until I empty myself. That's why Paul said that his life was being poured out like a drink offering. That's what Paul said. So important. That's why he said that his life was being crucified so that Christ could live, so that Christ could live inside of him. That's the Christian life. And so I'm telling you, it's willpower does not work. It's only God's power that does. Step number four, whatever number we're on. Next, the next number here is you've got to find a trusted friend who will call you out and encourage you. You need to try, find a trusted friend. And I use the f word their friend there, and now I'm going to build a case that it really isn't a friend at all. It's a mentor. What you need in your life more than anything else is a mentor. So we're going to talk about what that looks like in your life because I think it's absolutely essential. Hebrews chapter 10 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. That's the, that's the reason that I'm in the body of Christ is so that others around me can motivate me to love and to good works. We live in an age of isolation. And in an age of isolation, we need to have mentors in our life. And a mentor is, is more than just a friend. And here's why. Here's why it's more than a friend. A friend sometimes is so loyal to me, cannot see my blind spots. A friend can be so close to me, cannot see the blind spots inside of my life. So I need somebody who is going to look at my life objectively and say to me, that's stupid, Dan. That is dumb. Why would you think that? I need mentors in my life. Not just negatively. I also need to have mentors in my life that say, way to go. Awesome. Major way. Way to go. That's, that is awesome that you're doing that. I need both of those things inside of my life. And friends alone will not do that. It's, it's more than a friend. It's more than a friend. So what do I look for in a mentor? First of all, I want to know, this is what I'm looking for in a mentor. I'm looking for somebody who struggles well. I'm not looking for somebody who, who thinks they have their act together and somehow can straighten me out. Good luck with that. Come on now, do you know who I really am? I'm a mess. I'm a mess just like you. I need somebody who is struggling well but not giving in to temptation. I need someone who is honest and transparent about the struggles that they have in their life, saying, you know what, this is where I want to be, this is not where I am, but this is where I want to be, and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling well to get there. That's what I need inside of my life. Everybody needs mentors in their life, and if you think that you're the exemption, you're just simply not. You're lying. That's one of the lies that you're, you're saying to yourself, and uh, you need someone who is willing day by day to walk with you in victory and failure, Helping you up when you need. Sometimes pushing you down when you need. But you need somebody that's going to be able to be willing to do that. 
So I want to give you a picture here that I think will help you. Imagine that you choose to scale Mount Everest and you've, you've shelled out $60,000 to, to buy Sherpa guides and after a few days you finally arrive at the 26,000 feet level and uh, you struggled hard to get there because it was a major climb but you're there, your, Sherp, your Sherpas got you there and I want you to imagine that at some point your Sherpas say, come to you and say, you know, you did really well here. The first part of the climb, you've made it good. What if your Sherpas said, ah, that's it, I'm not going any, any further. You're on your own, I think you can do this. You'd, be, you, you know, you'd already spent $60,000 for these dudes. So you want them to take you all the way to the top, right? What we need in our life is someone to walk with us through the death zone. That's what that zone is. After, that, after they get to that base camp, after that to get to the top is the death zone. There's no oxygen. People die all the time on that trail. What we need is people that are going to walk with us through that death zone who, want, who won't walk out just because life gets tough. And everybody needs somebody who is going to be, who has walked that walk before. I want to know in my mentor that you've been to the top. You know what that feels like. You know how to get there. You know the journey. You know the path. You know what it takes. That's what I need in my life. That's the kind of mentor that I want. So how do you find a mentor. How do you find that? Because I know what you're thinking going, that'd be great, Pastor Dan, but the truth is I don't even know where to start looking and I've looked before and I, I can't find them. So where do you find those kind of mentors? Well, first of all, I would say you find someone who's still climbing the mountain. I'm not looking for a used to be. I'm not looking for someone sitting in a rocking chair saying this is how life used to be. I want to have somebody who's in the game walking with Jesus. And that doesn't mean that... You, you know, some of the best mentors are 80, 90 years old. I'm not saying that age is something that disqualifies someone. What I'm saying is they've got to be in the game. You have to be in the game serving Jesus. That's what a good mentor is. I need someone who's going to walk beside me and sometimes in front of me. That's what I'm looking for inside of a mentor. Someone who is in it for others. Someone who is sold out to Jesus. And, uh, and so if you're looking for someone like that, I would say a great, if you're new here to Grace, I'd say a great place for you to start is at our Rooted Experience. And so there should be a slide up there and uh, tells you how to text in and, and sign up for Rooted right now. I encourage you to do that because you're going to be put in an experience with 10 other people and you're going to be able to walk through life with them for 10 weeks and maybe you could find someone there. If not there in a small group, if not there somewhere, I'm telling you where you don't find, you don't find them at bars. I'm just telling you. That's not where you find your mentors. You don't find them in wrong places. You find them in the right places. You with me on that? So let me just make this personally. If you don't think you need a mentor, you are wrong. You are wrong. Simple as that. You're believing a lie. If you think you can do this on your own, you're just not telling yourself the truth. Last step is meditate on the truth. The last step is meditate on the truth. If I'm going to discipline my mind, I've got to create a new pathway. And the only way I can create that pathway is by meditating on the truth. So studies show this. Studies show that if you take, a, if we took a blind person, blindfolded them, put them on stage, ask them to walk the distance from that point over there to this point over there. If we ask them to walk across the stage, chances are they would walk off the stage because you need a point of reference to be able to walk a straight line. Meditation is that device that God has given to us that gives us the ability to walk a straight line. And when I talk about meditation, I'm not talking about a casual reading of the Word of God. So you started that last week, some of you. That's awesome. You're great. Perfect. Now let's take it to another level. Let's up the game just a bit. Let's talk about meditation, not medication. <laughs> that, that... That is something altogether different for another sermon. So we're not talking about medication. We're talking about meditation here today. You know what's interesting? I made that same mistake in the first service. I did it again. I did it again. Maybe I need medication. So I want to quote a, one of my heroes in the faith, a guy by the name of J.I. Packer. Anybody heard of him? Great author, great man of faith, guy, a man who's been in the mountain and back. So let me quote him. This is what he says about meditation. Meditation is the activity of calling to mind, 
thinking over, dwelling on, and applying to oneself the various things one knows about the works and ways and purposes and promises of God. Now, I'm going to say it to you one more time because you probably missed some of that, didn't you? Meditation is the activity of calling to mind, thinking over, dwelling on, applying to oneself the various things one knows about the works and ways and purposes and promises of God. It is an activity of holy thought, consciously performed in the presence of God, under the eye of God, by the help of God, as the means of communicating to God. Its purpose is to clear one's mental and spiritual vision of God, to let his truth make its full and proper impact on one's mind and heart. It's a matter of talking to oneself about God and oneself. It is indeed often a matter of arguing with oneself, reasoning with oneself out of moods and doubts and unbelief to a clear and, and a clear and uh, powerful way to the, to the mechanism of God's power and his grace. Meditation is seen over and over and over again in the Bible. We're to meditate on God's word day and night. And so we want to give you that experience here today. So I'm going to pray, and you're going to stay in your seat. And we're going to spend about three minutes, and we're going to give you a tool, a, a method, an experience for you to meditate on the purposes and the promises and the power and, the, and, and, and about God himself, about you, about God. And so what I want us to do is let's just pray together. When I finish praying, I want you to keep your eyes closed. And you just follow the instructions that are given to you, okay? Is that a deal? So, Father, I come before you this day in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, I pray earnestly, God, that you will take the next three minutes. And the God, that you'll do some supernatural work in our lives as we meditate, think about, dwell on the purposes and the power and the presence of Christ himself. And I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just listen to these instructions. Let's just take a minute. Keep your eyes closed and remove from your mind all distractions. Maybe change your posture a little bit to be in a posture to receive what God has for you today. Maybe your hands are in your lap with your palms open, symbolizing your willingness to hear from God. Maybe you want them clasped like you're praying. Whatever's comfortable for you, just remove all distractions and focus on your breathing. Breathe in and out. As you breathe in, say in your head, Jesus. And breathe out, Lord of all. Breathe in, Jesus. Exhale, Lord of all. Breathe in, Jesus, King of kings. Exhale, Lord of all. Breathe in, Jesus all-powerful and mighty. Exhale, Lord of all. Breathe in Jesus, creator of everything, including you. Exhale, Lord of all. Breathe in Jesus, sustainer of your very life. He who just gave you that breath. Exhale, Lord of all. Breathe in Jesus, the one who chose to come and die for you. Exhale, Lord of all. Breathe in Jesus, who three days later defeated death and rose to live forever at the Lord's right hand. Lord of all. 
breathe in Jesus, who knows everything about you, including the number of hairs on your head, and loves you anyway. Exhale, Lord of all. Breathe in Jesus, the one and only true hope of the world. Exhale, Lord of all. Breathe in Jesus. Exhale, Lord of all. sing together. your eyes closed. Father God, we love you. Would you help us throughout this week and the rest of our lives to train our minds and our thoughts to be fixed on you, to walk out of here changed, and to practice your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.